Last year, 22% of all the new cars sold in Australia were light commercial, and a vast majority of those were these dual cab utes. To try and understand why such a large number are finding their way onto Australian driveways, we've brought 11 of the favourite and most interesting one-ton utes to the VinFast Proving Ground, where we're going to subject them to a series of data-driven tests. And then we're going to tell you what are the best dual cab utes money can buy. We'll talk about exciting. This is the lifestyle category, starting with the Ford Ranger Raptor with its Baja-inspired suspension. Next is the Mazda BT50 in Thunder Mode. We've got the Toyota Rugged X with its premium factory accessories. And lastly, the Jeep Gladiator Rubicon. There's nothing else like this on the road. Let's go have some fun. In our mainstream category, we have five models, starting with the all-new Isuzu D-Max. Now, this car obviously mechanically identical to the Mazda BT50, but as that car is in Thunder trim, this is the more affordable option. Mitsubishi's Triton is also here. Beneath that dynamic shield family styling there is a largely unchanged mechanical drivetrain. And speaking of which, it's the same deal for the Nissan Navara. Still got the strong 2.3 litre twin turbo diesel under there, under a nice new facelift. Ford's Ranger is also here in ultra popular XLT level of specification. This has the more advanced engine in it, the smaller two litre, but twin turbos means it has 500 newton meters. But the car they're all here to beat is this, the Toyota Hilux. This is in the most popular SR5 level of specification and the Hilux is Australia's favourite dual cab. It's going to be a tough battle. Rounding out the field, we've got our budget category, starting with the GWM Canon. Loaded with tech and super comfortable, but is that enough to knock the big dogs off the top? Lastly, the Stanyol Musso. Huge tray and a coil sprung rear end. Evan, that's our 11 utes, but now it's time to start putting them through their paces. The process will be thorough and objective, with each test producing measurable results that can be easily compared with the 10 other vehicles. Dynamics evaluation will determine how each model behaves on the road, while 4x4 tests gauge how they fare off-road. Performance testing looks at acceleration from standstill and in gear, as well as braking performance. And the acceleration performance analysis is repeated in the payload and tow testing this time with a 500 kilo load on board, and then a third time with a significant trailer load hooked up. Use the time codes to skip ahead or navigate to your favorite part using the progress bar below. Let's kick things off with the dynamics. The VinFast Proving Ground offers an extensive ride and handling facility that recreates a wide range of surfaces and conditions typically found on public roads. It's here that each ute is closely examined for noise, vibration and harshness, as well as general assessment of on-road attributes including low-speed manoeuvring and manners. Filling four seats with adults can reveal some surprising handling characteristics, as well as providing an opportunity to evaluate rear seat comfort and features. The most astounding thing for me, I think, is the fact that the Ranger has held up so well after 10 years, essentially, on the market. Ford really was ahead of the game back in 2011 when it was released, and in 2021 it still leads in so many important areas. It's certainly the most pleasurable to drive, especially if you like steering feel and feedback. It's the most comfortable to ride in. It's astounding that uh, an Australian team have managed to put together a car that has had such longevity um, and kind of still lords it in its class. It's great. Coming into this comparison, I was expecting a bit more from a few of the newer cars. The BT50 and Isuzu D-Max twins, for instance. They are very good trucks and in some ways they're class leading. In terms of driver interaction and enjoyment, as well as ride and comfort and refinement, they still trail the Ranger, and the Ranger is, as I said, 10 years old. 
I think I expected more from the Canon by GWM. High hopes there, but uh, in the end, you get what you pay for because it just isn't on the same uh, level or in the same league in terms of ride comfort, refinement, uh, performance, and um, driver appeal. So that's another disappointing thing for me. With twin live axles and off-road focused tyres, it was little surprise that the Jeep performed poorly on-road and fell to the bottom of the pack. The Mazda and Isuzu mechanical twins put up a strong fight, but ultimately it was the pair of blue oval badge contenders that demonstrated the Rangers' long-standing on-road manners are still the benchmark to beat. If you've liked this video, you know what to do. Hit subscribe or give us a like, or tell a friend, or Come and untangle me from the sports bar. Next up, we're off to the skid pan to really test the performance characteristics of each of these dual cab utes. While modern utes are leaps and bounds ahead of previous generations in terms of performance, can they accelerate and brake safely enough for you to consider putting your family in? Straight line performance tests were undertaken and broken down into a 0 to 100 km hour as well as 60 to 100 km per hour runs to develop a solid understanding of how each vehicle accelerated. It's all well and good to go fast, but how each chute stops is just as important. To determine which chute has the best braking performance, we conducted a series of wet and dry brake tests. The standout performer today was undoubtedly the Ford Ranger XLT. You might think, why the XLT and not the Raptor? They've got the same engine but the Raptor is quite a bit heavier and it's remarkable how much difference that makes. The XLT basically blew everything else away. It just rocketed off the line, 8.9 seconds to 100, which is pretty quick for a normal sedan, let alone a dual cab, and it was the only one of the diesels to crack 10 seconds. There were a couple of utes that were obviously the slowest, which were the cheapest utes we have here. The Sangyong Musso was 11.5 seconds to 100 and the Great Wall was 11.4. The Sangyong feels quite a lot stronger when you're from behind the wheel. You feel like you've got more grunt available, but they were essentially as fast as each other. I guess the Great Wall feels like the weakest car here. It feels like a small engine pulling a lot of ute. It always feels to be working quite hard, but it, you know, it wasn't necessarily that much slower than the rest. Well, the bad news is that none of these dual cab utes break particularly well, which might not be surprising. They're heavy. They haven't got particularly good tyres on them. They've got a high centre of gravity. But some of the standouts were the Triton, the D-Max, uh, the Hilux, the BT50. All of those just scraped under 40 metres, which isn't a particularly good result. Like a passenger car will normally do about 34, 35 metres to brake from 100 kilometres an hour in the dry. Whereas these utes are up around the 40 metre mark. And some of them are a lot worse than that. Uh, standouts for a different reason were the Rangers. They were pretty good against the stopwatch in acceleration, but in deceleration, they're very poor. On the wet braking, a lot of it came down to the tyres, which is always important. So obviously the more road-focused tyres you've got, the better they're probably going to perform, which is why the D-Max stood out and why cars like the Ranger Raptor, or the Gladiator in particular, just felt like they were sailing across the top of the surface on the water. They didn't really want to bite in and it was just ABS the whole way. Some of the wet braking behaviour was actually pretty alarming. Uh, hit the brakes at 100 k's an hour and they'd squirm around even with ESP and ABS on and everything like that. They would sort of take corrective lock. If you put steering in, it wouldn't really do much. And the difference between wet and dry braking, we're adding 18, 20 metres, sometimes more, between the wet and the dry surface, which could be disastrous in an emergency situation. As the only model with six cylinders and petrol power, you might expect the Jeep to dominate on a performance battle. But in this test, muscular torque and strong braking were key to coming out on top. Once again, the cheaper options languished, while solid diesel donks shone. The Ford Ranger was a surprise, as it didn't perform anywhere as well while braking as it did when accelerating. The GWM Cannon and Sangyong Musso were left lacking in this field, taking up the rear end result-wise for both acceleration and braking performance. If you're going to be spending a lot of time in a one-ton ute, then the interior is a big deal. 
Starting with the Ford Ranger is probably a good place because this is one of the oldest uh, models we're testing here. And sadly, the Ranger's interior is starting to show its age a little. Fortunately though, Ford didn't go too style heavy with the interior of the Ranger, and that means it hasn't dated all that much. It's simple and clean and actually still does its job really well. It has updated a few things. We're up to Sync 3 in the infotainment system. Lovely eight inch screen there, works really nicely. I actually really like the way that system works. I always have done. And they've updated a few other things like there's a 12 volt power here, a couple of USBs down here. There's a real clean utilitarian feel to the whole cabin up front um, but one of my favorite features how's this there's a cd player i remember them the ranger sets a really good standard for the rest of the field in the back seats too this is one of the roomiest cabins um, i've got my favorite the armrest there incorporating two cup holders the interior throughout the whole cabin is upholstered in cloth in the XLT. Um, I don't mind it. It's really, really tough wearing type of fabric. It doesn't look too daggy, um, but so much space back here. I've got loads of tow room underneath the seat in front, mat pockets. Uh, a real good point is a 230 volt um, power point down here next to a 12 volt power point. It's also huge up here as well. I'm about six foot two and I've got loads of headroom, really comfortable, loads of knee room. One exclusion and omission though is this is one of the few rear seat rows that doesn't have an air vent. Now we all know this vehicle's a value proposition. So while it's the cheaper end of the scale, it doesn't feel nasty in here. And I do like that about it. You've got everything you need and nothing you don't. The switch gear is nice and simple. You've got plenty of charging points, and a smaller but yet decent sized screen here. All the plastics feel nice and solid, and you've got a little bit of highlight here just to break up the, the, the black, let's be honest, it's a very dark interior. Two cup holders, terrain modes, a simple four wheel drive switch. What else do you want? The seats are comfortable, but it definitely is on the smaller side in here. This is definitely a narrower vehicle. So if you're looking at carting around a larger family, probably not the vehicle for you. But for a couple or a young family, this thing's a winner. We're in the back of the Triton now. Much like the front, it's a fairly no frills affair. There is a decent amount of headroom. I still, I do touch, but again, I'm on the lanky side, but I can fit pretty comfortably. Plenty of grab handles and some basic controls here to operate the roof mounted vents. A small amount of storage here. It's certainly not that deep, but you do have this little cubby here for your phones and two USB points. So two people in the back can charge their equipment. Seats are fairly comfortable, but they do feel a little bit dated. Again, you're not paying too much for this vehicle, so I can accept these compromises. Probably one of the most important to look at is the Toyota Hilux, easily one of the most favorite one-ton utes in Australia. Every time I get in the Hilux, I really struggle to see why. In here, it is a veritable plastics festival. It's everywhere from this really weirdly designed dashboard with just a needless level of complexity and this strange terrace design to the leather on the steering wheel. I don't know how Toyota has done it, but it's made leather feel like plastic. No leather on the seats, that's cloth. I don't have a big problem with cloth on seats, but this is a bit 80s or 90s in its pattern. I'm, I'm not dead keen on that. And yeah, just this, this sea of plastics everywhere. It just really drags the interior down, makes it feel quite cheap. There's a good level of technology I've got Android Auto and Apple CarPlay in this uh, updated information entertainment system. And there's a tiny little uh, digital display in between the analog dials. And up here I've got a really old school looking digital clock. I don't know, perhaps I'm being unfair on the, on the Hilux, but I just don't understand why it attracts the audience it does. This is the SR5 level specification. So it represents the volume seller for the Toyota Hilux. And it means you get reasonable levels of equipment. Um, back here, it's pretty spartan though. I've got some vents for the air conditioning. I've got a center armrest, so brownie points for that. Um, but it's, it's a bit basic. It's also a bit claustrophobic as well, not the most spacious. But I do have one big problem with it back here, and that, that is the most stupidly placed grab handle I've ever seen. All it's gonna take is one little lurch and your head's gonna end up rather painful off that. And one other thing I quite like though, are these little carrier bag hooks. Uh, Rated to four kilos. I don't know about you, but I like to carry home significantly more than four kilos of curry. Up next, the D-Max. And there's one word 
that's in my head when I think of this vehicle, and that's practical. Everything here is simple and practical and it works. Starting with this little console here for your wallet or anything you want to put in there. And we've got plenty of storage here and here as well. Lots of storage. Another cool feature, I'll lean over, the cup holders. I reckon they're the best in the business. It's pretty similar to the Hilux, but a really good addition, very handy. Now working our way in, got some nice highlights and your hard plastics, but they've made an effort to really dress this up. Nice useful infotainment system, everything here that you need. Again, simple, practical, and I really like that. I respect it about this vehicle. Storage wise, it's not the greatest, it's not the worst, but you've definitely got enough room. If you need a vehicle that's just gonna work and do its job, you found it. This is the back seat of the D-Max, and just like the front, practical. That's the word you're gonna hear me say over and over again. Not too much headroom. We are a little bit limited here, but again, I am on the lanky side. It's good to see folding grab handles too, so they don't protrude on your head, which is not a good thing. These are a good thing. In terms of features, pretty limited. You've got somewhere to put your phone, a USB point to charge it. Again, it works. You've got air vents, and room to put your books or toys or whatever you've got back here. So practical, 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 practical. That's the term I'm gonna use, and I think that describes the D-Max to a T. My favorite part of the BT50 Thunder's interior is when you're in here, you don't have to look at the exterior. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just, I don't like what they've done with the exterior styling of this particular variant. And when you think about how much it costs, nearly $69,000, maybe stick to one of the ones in the middle of the range. The interior though, as I say, is a great place to be. It's probably one of the most car-like feeling of all the utes we've got here. With this lovely leather upholstery, it's got a really nice design, very supportive, feels really, really comfortable here. Same can be said for this very car-like steering wheel. And then the central touchscreen is, is huge and a lovely resolution, got lots of good features and graphics in there. It's not all about styling in here though, it's practical as well, decent door pockets, and I love this kind of double glove box thing here. Interesting storage solutions. It's not quite as comfortable in the rear seats and there's not enough support under the thighs back here either. It is quite spacious and they've pulled the same trick of doing a, a black roof liner for a really classy and premium feel. There's a USB charger back here, which is a bit fiddly to get open. Some air vents as well. And I really like you've got speakers in the ceiling here for a, for a nicer sound system. The Navara is probably one of those utes that doesn't get enough credit. And maybe that's because it's a little bit forgettable and benign. And that's because it's actually getting really rather old now. This one has just been updated for 2021, but there's still tons of features that show its age, like more of these horrible spray painted plastic trims and this chrome look surround to the gear stick. And the same on this door handle here, it's, it's horrid. It's as horrid as, as this nasty plastic on the dashboard. But they are trying though, and the seats are upholstered in a combination of leather, that's leather, and this is synthetic leather, and this nice sort of hexagonal pattern. And the other thing I absolutely love is this new steering wheel. That's part of the update, and it looks like something out of one of Nissan's sports models. The information and entertainment system was also updated with the 2021 update, and although you might not believe it, because it still looks a little bit dated, if I'm completely honest, it now contains Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. The back seat in the Navara is not the most spacious. There's enough room and enough headroom, but it just feels one of the more claustrophobic. And the seats are not particularly supportive. With my feet on the ground, my thighs have no support underneath them, and they just feel like they've been designed for a shorter person. It's the same up front, actually. At least I do get a center armrest and more of the synthetic and real leather combination. Here I've got air vents and one USB power point, but that's about it. My favorite thing back here, though, is this electric sliding window. You operate it from the front. I've no idea what I would do with that, but I just love it. We're inside the Jeep Gladiator Rubicon, and as you can see, it's a pretty exciting place to be. But it's not only exciting, it's also utilitarian, which is the purpose of this vehicle. So starting with the infotainment, you've got an off-road app, which is really handy. It control controls a whole different range of things very unique to this vehicle. We've also got front and rear diff locks, sway bar disconnect. There's also auxiliary switches, so you can wire in accessories without messing up the dash. 
Something I really like is an old school lever for the transfer case. This is the only vehicle on this test with this technology, but it works. It's simple, it's quick, it's easy. Now in terms of storage, we've got a cubby here with two layers and it's nice and deep. Another unique feature to this Jeep is the removable roof, which is also called the Freedom Panels. It's the only dual cab on the market where you can take the roof off and chuck a load in the tray. We're in the back of the Jeep now, and as you can see, there's a fair bit of headroom. I'm nearly two meters tall, so that's not bad. But we do have this crossbar here with speakers, which if you are sort of my height, that could be, uh, that could be a bit interesting. That's the price you pay for Freedom, I guess. Back here, minimal controls. You've got air con vents, window controls, and some cup holders. The back of the seat, you've got some netting for your tactical tools, your torches, whatever you're into. And some straps, no idea what they're for, but they're there. So it's rather basic. It is roomy, it is comfortable. So now we're inside the Toyota Rugged X. And look, let's be honest, if you've ever sat in a SR5 Hilux or many others in the range, it's a pretty familiar package. You do get a premium JBL sound system though, which is awesome. You also get a lot of hard plastics, but hey, it's a hard working off-road vehicle. You do have these heated leather seats, which is a nice touch, but that's pretty much it. This is all about the outside of the vehicle. Up next, we're in the Ford Ranger Raptor. Now, talk about a mix between sporty and utilitarian. You've got this pretty simple dash layout with hard plastics in the center console, but then you get these awesome bolstered seats with a bit of velour in the middle. They're super comfy and they hold you in when you're drifting around corners in Baja mode. We've got a different steering wheel, with of course your red reference guide or whatever you call that, and we've got some blue piping here. So they have made an effort to make this a more premium package because you are paying a lot more for the privilege. So it's not just a good looking vehicle on the outside, I rate it on the inside too. Even though Sangyong has been around in Australia longer than you might think, it's still regarded as one of the more challenger brands. And that means it has to do everything right. First impressions on its interior are actually quite good. I met with things like a leather wrapped steering wheel with pretty good ergonomics. And there's more, what I suspect is leather on the gear stick. But then you look a little bit further and there's things like cheapy plastics on this handbrake. Who has a handbrake anymore? And then there's more cheap plastics elsewhere and then some good quality materials. So it's a little bit to and fro. But there are other good signs like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto is standard and also other luxuries like this digital display in front of the two analog gauges and even things like heated seats and cooled seats. Oh, and heated steering wheel too. It really does a bit of both in here. And it's pretty much the same story in the back seats too. Good touches include an all black interior, which is a really good trick for making it feel more premium. And also there's more leatherette material. It's difficult to tell whether that's real or not. Good storage in the door pockets and also underneath the seats, there's loads of space there. I've also got a center armrest. Not all utes have that. And I've got vents for the passengers back here. But yeah, the interior is generally pretty good back here, spacious. The doors are a bit deceptive though. They look really big, but it's not all useful doors. Some of it just overhangs the tray and actually doesn't do a lot or make the aperture much bigger. But generally the view out is good. Passengers back here would probably have quite a good time. The first thing you notice when you get into the GWM is this huge screen. It's really impressive. It's full of loads of cool graphics and lots of good features, including like the Sangyong, Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as standard. But then you start to move away from that screen and things aren't so good anymore. These very plasticky switches and some finishes like, I could have I could have sprayed that in my garage. You know, it looks like someone didn't like the original color and they just changed it with a spray can from Super Cheap. Then below there you get a very aftermarket looking 12 volt socket and the USBs, they look like they've just been thrown in with a generic panel you could buy anywhere. The gear selector feels, oh, I can't even find the words. There are some good materials. Again, another nice steering wheel, but there's too much in here that lets it down. In the back seat, it's not great. Let's start with some of the positives. There's loads of space. I've got some privacy glass here for if I'm feeling particularly special. 
The seat upholstery is possibly the least convincing fake leather I've encountered in quite a long time. There's tons of legroom down here. It's pretty comfortable. No center armrest. My pet hate back here. But other good things include some air vents for the rear passengers. And below that, you've got a 220 volt socket for power. And next to that, another USB charger. Mixed feelings again about this one. Some good points and some, some that really don't sort of sell itself very well. And this horrid homemade metallic finish as well. An examination of the cabin comfort and technology gave the more affordable models an opportunity to claw back some badly needed points, with both the Sanyong and GWM sitting comfortably in the median region. None of our 11 stood out from the crowd, with the exception of the Mazda, which delivers a luxurious interior, sharp infotainment system, and a decisive victory here. The Canon's infotainment is visually impressive, but in practice, the features and function couldn't match its appearance. Overall, Ford Sync 3 system was the top scorer, but some curious glitches in the Raptor's infotainment prevented it matching the XLT's high score. Up next is our towing test. We're about to hook up the Turbo Taxi from Street Machine to these youths to see how they perform in the real world. Street Machine was kind enough to lend us their Turbo Taxi Project Ford Falcon, which was strapped to a car trailer for a real-world example of what you'll be towing with these utes. Acceleration times from 20 km hour to 60 km per hour were recorded, then we set out on a gruelling test loop to see which ute towed the best. Now for the load wheel towing, we're certainly getting up there for what these dual cabs can handle safely. Sure, some are rated to tow more, but I think having a vehicle on the back of a car trailer that's pretty much the sweet spot for what these utes can do. In regards to the winner, it's got to go to the Ford Ranger. It was the quickest between 20 and 60 kilometres. It also felt the most sure-footed. The suspension was amazing. You could tell this thing's been designed for Australian conditions. It's a great tow vehicle. A surprise package was the Jeep, the Gladiator Rubicon. With that 3.6 litre petrol motor, it pulled like nothing else. It really went. But in terms of a tow vehicle, it was probably one of the worst. The suspension was all over the shop and the gearbox just didn't want to change. It was just happy sitting at five grand all day long. Towards the end of the pack in the towing field, we've got to give that to the Sangyon Musa, unfortunately. It was adequate performance wise, but it did feel a little bit jiggly and it was certainly slow off the line. GWM's Canon did itself no favors, turning up to this test without a tow bar installed and forfeited any points, something to hide maybe. And that allowed the Toyota Hilux to demonstrate one of the reasons it continues to be an Australian favourite. Only the Ranger XLT could outhaul the Big T with impressive acceleration and exceptional road matters when hooked up. Next up, we're loading a 500 kilo weight into the tray of each ute and going for a drive to see how they handle a payload. For payload testing, the same process used in the tow testing was repeated. This time though, the trailer was unhitched and a 500 kilo dead mass secured in the rear load area. As this class of vehicle gets its name from the ability to haul about a ton in the tub, the vehicles are loaded with half that maximum capacity. There were a couple surprises today for the laden test which involved both acceleration testing and a loop on the ride and handling circuit. Standout performer was the Ford Ranger XLT, which was not only a cut above its sibling in the Raptor, but above everything else for acceleration and its composure around a ride and handling with 500 kilos on the back. Yeah, it just felt really composed. The ride wasn't too compromised by that load and it just felt really settled and, and almost predictable as well. Uh, otherwise than that, there were some surprise performers in the Navara. I think that was a really good car, uh, even though it's on a coil sprung rear end. It handled the load quite well, it was very solid out there on the ride and handling circuit and the transmission mapping was really good as well. And of course there are some cars that didn't perform too well either, like the Sanyong Muso has a really huge tray, but when you lay in it with a lot of weight, the car's coil sprung rear end has nothing left to give in terms of ride absorbency and it feels quite um, nervous out on the ride and handling loop. 
As for trays, a lot of them follow a familiar formula. Uh, obviously the Hilux SR5 comes with a farmer's tray, which is a lot more practical. It's wide, um, it's easy to access, but it's also very shallow. Then you have the Jeep, which has a lot of features, including lights, adjustable tie down points, fixed tie down points, and a soft cover. But really the, the biggest was the Muso and most practical. Then there's the tray in the GWM, which for a cheap car has a surprising amount of kit, including a step down ladder in the rear tailgate and some soft drop struts, which are missing on more expensive variants like the Rugged X. Perhaps unsurprisingly, almost anything with a coil sprung rear axle struggled with our half ton payload, except the Navara, which was the most stoic of the coil spring tail enders. But the testing was dominated by tried and tested leaf sprung suspension, including the Mitsubishi Triton and, once again, Ford's Ranger XLT. So it's safe to say you can't have a four-wheel drive dual cab ute test without a four-wheel drive component. We've come out to this purpose-built location to put each of these vehicles through exactly the same test. There's no favours here. Well, it's time to get dirty as we put these dual cab utes through our purpose-built off-road test course. We're looking to compare ground clearances, wheel travel, traction control systems and how easily they engage 4x4. We also want to know how they ride over corrugations and washouts at speed. Exactly how you would be testing them in the real world. Testers drove them down steep hills to measure low range gearing, then pointed them at steep inclines to see if they bottomed out. Some utes did exceptionally well, while others struggled to make it to the top. The off-road component of what we've been doing is a major part of this test. We wanted to include lots of different disciplines, different terrains to really get a good understanding of what these vehicles can and can't do. Now in terms of the most capable on test, it's got to be the Jeep. It has to be front rear lockers, sway bar disconnect, mud terrain tyres. This thing didn't even bat an eye. Absolutely amazing off-road. In terms of surprise package, I've got to say the Navara. I actually really liked the way it performed. The suspension felt good and the gearing was amazing. No need for hill descent control, it just crawled down with that engine braking. Bringing up the rear, I've got to say the least capable vehicle would have to be the Sangyong Muso. It struggled up some of the hill climbs that others were able to achieve at a crawling pace without any trouble. Once again, the cheap models slid into the back, quite literally, when the sealed road came to an end, leaving traditional off-road favourites to show them how it's done. While the Hilux and Ranger demonstrated excellent ability, the Jeep highlighted while it's still the most competent off-the-shelf 4x4 money can buy. It might not be as glamorous as diff locks and turbos, but the cost of running a one-tonner can be a deal-breaker for many. In this quiet test of numbers, the Sangyong demolished everything thanks to a bargain entry price, cheap servicing and a whopping seven year warranty. The Mazda and Isuzu are mechanically almost identical, but the D-Max is offered with a warranty that extends a whole year longer than the BT50 at six years. If you've liked this video, you know what to do. Hit subscribe, give us a like, tell a friend or maybe send me a postcard. At simple face value and on initial inspection, all one-ton utes may appear to be largely alike, including some more recent lesser known offerings at the budget end of the spectrum. On paper, each of the 11 models tested in our dual cab mega test offer respectable power and torque outputs, four wheel drive and somewhere to put the family and a load of kit. But it's only after you dig a little deeper that a whole world of difference separating the field becomes clear. Put simply, you get what you pay for. While the cheap challenges include a decent amount of kit for your cash and apparent good value, the package looks less compelling when it comes to hard yakka. And while one tonners used to be utilitarian workhorses, options like Raptor and Rubicon are injecting luxury and capability where farm machinery once played. Perhaps the closest battle is fought in the midfield where familiar faces and brands offer a broad spectrum of on- and off-road ability combined with day-to-day -day ease of use. 
Mitsubishi's Triton is still proving that no frills and solid value are high up on Australia's Ute must-haves, while the Nissan Navara continues to represent a stoic and often unsung hero in the market. But at the top of the pack is the venerable Ford Ranger XLT. Toyota's flagship Hilux Rugged X and fresh-faced Isuzu D-Max are incredibly complete machines. But the relatively new hardware isn't up to the recipe of sophisticated power plant combined with Aussie-engineered strength and dependability. The T6 Ranger might be in its twilight year, but the XLT is still the one-ton uke to beat. <laughs>